Hello, it's uh, really uh, a pleasure and honor to be here at Dream Come True. So, yes, I am an underwater archaeologist. I uh, explore caves, and uh, to be an underwater archaeologist in Yucatan, you really have to also uh, explore dry caves. There's lots of them in, in Yucatan. You know, it's a karstic uh, plain, and uh, we cannot understand uh, cenotes if we don't understand dry caves. They had a strong symbolism for the ancient Maya, and they both represented uh, the same, the entrance to the underworld, to the sacred world, to the world of supernatural. Uh, our research takes place in Yucatan. Of course, it's in Mexico, and we are here in this area, we are exploring Chichen Itza. We're going to talk about Chichen Itza a little bit. And this is Mesoamerica, a term that a researcher employed a long time ago, and we know it as a cultural area. So Mesoamericans share a lot of um, cultural traits. I do really have the coolest job in the world. It's uh, a perfect combination of extreme sports, adventure, mystery, science. And when you're hanging on a line like that, it's, uh, it's time to to think about a lot of things that happened in the past. And being hanging on that line uh, was a very good point of advantage for one of our discoveries that I'm going to mention at the end. So I'm going to talk about water as well, because uh, water was sacred for the Maya, of course. And this is why they sometimes deposit some people in the water, in the cenotes, which sometimes is hard to understand. But we believe most of these deposits were uh, mainly bones. Uh, of course, there must have been also deposit of bodies that decomposed there. Uh, human sacrifice was a fact uh, for the Mesoamerican people, especially uh, heart extraction. We can see this uh, depiction there. It's a beautiful iconography from the classic period. This guy has his chest open. Sometimes they try to bring the heart out of the chest, still beating, uh, because blood was important. It was an offer. It was not only the life of this individual offered to the gods, but also uh, the, the blood. Chichen Itza is a perfect example, and it's one of the places that mark our research. We had to start somewhere, and we started on the matter of all the cenotes, uh, the sacred cenote. But for those of you that don't know well, cenote is, cenote is a flooded cave. And cenote comes from the Maya zonot, which means something like a hole in the, in the ground. And these holes in the ground are, are, are fantastic because they are really the entrance to the underworld, and archaeologists know that. And we know that going into those holes, we're going to find cool stuff. <laughs> this is Mr. Edward Thompson. And he bought Chichen Itza for the equivalent now of uh, $35, included the cenote, the site, everything. And uh, a lot of Mexicans are a little bit still in disagreement with that. But uh, it was another time. It was a very different context. And uh, something that I know about him is that he was a very brave man. He was the first cenote diver ever. Of course, he used this hard uh, hat equipment. He must destroy a lot on the bottom. But I think he sink on the bottom uh, for a long way, maybe to the knee. Uh, on the photo, this is a Greek diver that accompany Mr. Thompson. And then the sacred cenote, the legend of, of the virgins. Uh, maybe some of you still think about the sacred cenote as a place where they toast beautiful virgins. Uh, kind of disagree a little bit with that idea. I think, uh, you know, this is a very nice illustration from National Geographic magazine, 1961, October. Uh, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's very nice. I mean, it's very beautiful, it's very romantic. Uh, but I think the Maya were just as human as we are, and they were not stupid. And uh, maybe if they chose women, they uh, were look more likely like uh, the modern law, some of them. So, uh, and, and this, is, this is true because when we analyzed the bones of the sacred cenote, what we found is that most of them were children, which is a striking situation. It's, uh, in all Mesoamerica, children were the favorite uh, for, uh, to be sacrificed for the gods. Uh, on the adult population that I have the opportunity to analyze, um, most of the uh, adults were male, very few female, and uh, they were old, like 25, 35, okay? All for Maya standards, of course. Okay, so 
we had that information and we also had a beautiful information that we came across. Uh, some documents from the 16th century. Uh, the uh, Bishop Diego de Landa tried to in install the, the, the uh, Catholic religion. He wasn't successful, not nowadays. There's still Maya rituals in, in this time. But anyway, he really tried to do it and he prosecuted the idolaters, as he, he called them. And uh, he do these trials and do maybe a little bit of torture. And uh, we found these documents uh, written on a book by Scrolls and Adams in 1938. It, it's a book that has been around for a long time, but n not one single archaeologist had paid attention to it. And then we uh, investigated a little bit, and we found that there was at least 200 mentions of human sacrifice, and they describe the area, the names of the villages, the names of the cenotes, the names of the priests, and most of these sacrifices were performed on children. So that was the next step, go to the field and try to see if there are really human remains, and yeah, we find a lot. But these documents didn't only take us to uh, the water, the precious water. Uh, they take us also to dry caves, such as this one. This is a very important cave. This is the first time it's presented. And um, we think it's uh, one of the best discoveries our team have had. It's a place at the south of the state of, uh, of Yucatan. And we get, uh, we, we, we find it because of these chronicles. They describe caves and cenotes. And inside the cave, it, it's a very long cave. It's about 350 feet drop off. And then you have to work, walk for uh, four hours to get to the, to the end of the cave. Well, it's not the end of the cave, but to the, to the place I want to show you now. And you find a lot of uh, modifications of the cave. It's like little rooms, they make tunnels, they make you go through uh, different, uh, like different steps, different uh, tests. Uh, there is altars, there is a, a beautiful altar. This is a different cave than the one that I'm describing, but uh, it's an example of uh, what an altar is. You know what, what is fantastic about these caves? They have not been touched. Maybe we were the first ones entering there after 1,000 years, and you can see the fingerprints of, of the person that made that altar. That, that's fantastic, that's so thrilling. There is some other altars, uh, not uh, as elaborate as the other one, but just as important. This is uh, an altar made of speleothems, stalactites and stalagmites. It's like a little stone house, and it has this offering in the middle. And what stands out uh, from that offering is this phallic form, and it's a stalactite. And stalactites are related to fertility. And uh, you know, the, the ancient Maya, even nowadays in Chiapas, the Maya, when enter a cave, they tell you that the stalactites, when they're dropping, this is the breast of the earth that is feeding the earth. And the stalagmites that are growing up, they are the, the phallus of, of the earth. When they get together and form a column, they are copulating. So it, it's, it's a very uh, old way to, to, to see the caves. Then after all that, all these tri um, tunnels and, and, and modifications take you to this fantastic mural. This is a unique uh, work of art in the Maya area. It's a jaguar, a deer, and, and a bird, and some signs that we have not identified. We had uh, consulted with some of our colleagues, experts in iconography, and they said this might be a very old representation of these mythical animals that can go in and out from the underworld very easily. This is a huge mural. This is a uh, human scale, so you can see how big it is. It's about 10 by 10. And it's in a place, I, I'm standing there, but there is a, a drop off in front of me. They might have uh, place some scaffold or something to, to do it. They do a lot of effort to do these things. But this is what really, really strikes us. It's a unique form of uh, art in caves. We have never seen something like this. Uh, they were better than, than James Cameron to get to the 3D. This is a 3D representation of a, a tapir, maybe, another mythical animal. This animal, if you look well, it looks like it's coming out from the from the wall, it's uh, it's unbelievable. We are using our carbide um, light with a little flame, so this flame made everything kind of flicker. And when we enter that room, you really feel the animal is coming out. It's like guarding the place. It's it's fantastic. We we get the effect that the ancient Maya wanted to wanted to uh, to have with this with this form of art. 
And he's guarding this. It's uh, probably the representation of a Seva tree. It's a tree because you, we can see the huge column. It looks like a tree and there is like uh, branches. Uh, this uh, was first observed in Balancanche cave by Dr. Willis Andrews a long time ago in the 50s. And uh, now we archeologists look for these forms because we know they represent the tree uh, that is sustaining the universe, the axis mundi of, of the Maya universe. And what it, this tree is guarding, or what this, all this art, all this long way is taking to is a little, a very little body of water, a little body of sacred water. So maybe this was made in times of drought, or uh, we have archaeological proof that there was a huge drought on the 10th century. This is reported by the paleoclimatologists. Dr. Brenner have uh, a lot of work on that. And uh, he said there was a brutal drought. Um, in several centuries. One of them was the 10th century, and this drought lasted like five or six years. So we know that the water on the cenotes, on the caves, it's uh, controlled by the ocean. But if it stops raining, the level should go down. And this is what we're looking on these artifacts and bones. Uh, on that photograph, you can see a skull. It's deposited at about five feet from the surface. It's uh, flooded now, but uh, we believe it was intentionally deposited by the ancient Maya. We know they didn't have diving equipment. They were probably good uh, breath holders but uh, they don't have anything to see. They didn't have torches for underwater. So we believe the water level was lower. So they get there maybe in a canoe or some device and made the deposit, maybe because they had this huge drought. Even though the Maya of Chichen Itza, we have to say it, were very smart and handled a very strategic um, uh, way to survive using the cenotes. And uh, that's very important because we want to relate our investigation to climate change and to the changes uh, 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 during the, through the areas. Uh, looking for Maya remains and going deeper and farther away all the time, thanks to the new technology, methodology, the ways we have to, to get into, the, into the, the deep caves, we found bears, the first bears ever reported in a cave. There is five, there's a family, and it looks like they all die at the same time. So maybe it was a catastrophic event that might have happened 10, 12, or maybe 15,000 years ago. And look at the state of preservation of these bones. That's another very important thing on uh, our cenotes. Just to end uh, my presentation, I will ask for just a more minute to show you um, a beautiful uh, cenote. But it's not only beautiful, this is not a postcard for tourists. I think the ancient Maya use this cenote because of its beauty, because of the clarity of water, because of the sacredity of water, because they, they had droughts, they, they were in trouble, and they were there, and they found divinity there. Just want to thank you for your attention. And, and